grateful, man. Thank you so much for coming around. I'm really grateful. Like, I'm really so grateful. Thank you, man. <laughs> my name is Imod Mowali. I would like to do a brief introduction of myself and what I do and what I really wanted you to be on this platform. My name is Timod Mowali and I'm, I'm a podcaster. And I'm also, I'm also a media enthusiast. I, I go out there to archive story of young Nigerians that are doing great out there. Um, I believe stories are one of the ways we can mentor young Nigerians on how to do, um, on how to achieve vision and how to achieve their goals. I believe story is one of those things that can help us mentor them. Um, and that was why I went out to search for people that are doing great. And you're actually one of those people that are doing great things. I believe you should hear your story and hear from me on how you're able to build this global brand and how we can, we young guys are coming up to build something as huge as what you have built. We want to learn from you how you have, if you are you able to build that in. And so probably you can learn from that and be able to replicate the great things you are doing. That. So thank you so much again for coming around on the show, Mark. So the first question I want to ask about from you is about your um, financial freedom and financial literacy. Um, growing up, I don't know, how was your financial freedom instinct? Were you, did you have that heart while you were growing up that I want to be rich? I'm going to be rich. I want to be rich. Was it something that was ringing in your heart um, growing up? Was financial freedom something that was so important to you while growing up? Okay. Um, hi, Timod. Uh, thanks for having me on your podcast. Um, it's great what you're doing, you know, telling stories of um, young people doing amazing stuff. I think stories are a great way to um, empower people and to, you know, inspire people. So great job there. Thank you so much. Um, it's so great to hear that from you. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I believe stories are very powerful. Um about financial freedom if you know growing up it's something that was always in my mind to be very honest growing up i'd say that you know maybe getting rich wasn't something that i thought about right um but when i look back now it must have been there somewhere right because at the end of the day i always did businesses right that led me to what i am doing now like you know businesses here and there i didn't even think of the things i did at the time as businesses but I always wanted to make money some way or the other because, you know, the truth of the matter is I love the finer things in life. And what are the finer things in life? You know, how do you get them? Most of it would come from money, right? Just having money um, and be able to be comfortable doing those things. So I think I always knew, you know, I watched um, a show growing up, uh, Kimura Life in the Fab Lane. It was about... Um, a woman who was building a fashion empire and i remember growing up you know i tell my dad oh i aspire to be like this woman mm -hmm. it might have just sounded like you know a young girl just saying you know whatever she felt like saying but thinking about it now you know there must have been something about the show that that you know i was drawn to which has you know led me to doing what I do now. So for sure, I'd, I'd say financial freedom at some point was there, but maybe I didn't recognize it as that. Oh, wow. Uh, do, do you think um, a lot of young Nigerians who were not um, financially literate enough, probably while we were growing up, a lot of us were probably career-based. We were like, we were more of school-based education, the four walls of school that, and probably our parents didn't tell us how important um, making money was or is then. Do you think that was a story for us then? Um, okay, so financial literacy for sure is very important, right? Um, it's I know that growing up, it's not something that parents spoke to you about, right? So financial literacy, I'd say it's some, is something that, you know, needs to be taught in school, if anything. If your parents can't do it, and I think parents should be teaching their kids, you know, how to save about investments, you know, they should be speaking about these things because at the end of the day, that's really how you build wealth. Uh -huh. um you know that's how you should also learn that in school you know in one of your finance classes or even in math class you know just learn here and there from it but unfortunately it's not something i grew up learning about i think for me i just picked interest and you know as i grew older i did a lot of reading i won't say i'm a big reader but i like to read like articles i like to ask questions and you know here and there i learned a lot um 
I'll say the way our mothers teach us financial literacy is not as open as the way that, you know, maybe kids abroad learn it. I'll give you an example. Growing up, my mom would always say, if you have some money, you know, money that you get from maybe visitors or like pocket money, she'd advise you to buy gold. But she wasn't really explaining to you that buying gold was an investment. You know what I mean? It was just buy gold because that's just a normal thing to do. Buy gold and keep it. And they would always just tell you, eh, because when you buy gold, you know, one day when you wake up and you don't have money, you can't sell it. But that's just it, right? You think it's a normal thing to do, but you don't realize that, you know, buying gold is investing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it changes your perspective. If they, if they had explained buying gold to me at the time as, oh, you're actually investing, it's you building wealth. I'll take it more seriously than, okay, I'm buying gold because, you know, I don't want to spend the money. Do you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So for sure, like, you know, financial literacy is so important. I think that it's something that parents should teach. It's something that, you know, schools should teach. Talking about this financial literacy and financial freedom, um, which a lot of us didn't get early in life. And after school, we are now hoping, then we discover that we are on our own. And um, the, the, the pressure for hustle, the pressure to make money, the pressure to become um, gets to hold us down. And a lot of us forget about our passion. I was reading through your story and I, I discovered that one of the things you made mention on was about how the business you are running right uh, started as a passion. I think you said even the first bag you made was something you wanted to make for yourself. But this day, um, passion, a lot of us have lost passion, not because we are not good at it, but because we are like, if I stay true to this passion and stay true to just it, um, I might not be able to survive. So we get to go on and, and push for the for us to make the money. So how were you able to sustain your own passion? Uh, how were you able to do it? Was it very easy for you? Was there a way you went through it and you're able to sustain that passion till it became a global, a global thing? I think this is a very important question. So I'll give you context, right? How for me, you know, passion was just something that I held on to. I'll tell you that when I started the business, it wasn't hunger to make money, right? I was in school. My parents were giving me pocket money, right? I was comfortable. I didn't really need the money. Do you know what I mean? So for me, I was just doing what I loved. And now when it became time for it to become a business because people were asking people whether to pay me for it, I was just excited, right? There was no business sense in it at the time. And that's the difference between me and somebody who, you know, has finished school, just needs to make money. Whether or not the passion is there, they need to make money somehow. That's the difference. And now, you know, for me, I, I think that passion is a great thing. But at the same time, if you're going to start a business, like, you know, passion is good. It's one thing. It will keep you going. But the business also needs to make sense. So if your passion is not something that can be, you know, converted to, you know, making money and, you know, sales in general or like just bringing you money in some sort of way, then, you know, at that point, I don't think it's it makes sense to follow your passion, right? Because some people's passion, realistically, is just to rest at home and sleep and wake up. You know, like, do you understand that? You can't convert that to money. <laughs> no, that, that's just the truth. If you ask me what my true passion is, I just want to sleep. But at the end of the day, um, passion is important, right? Because it will keep you going for really, really bad days in business. Um, for me, I, I told you, I was very lucky. It's almost like a privilege. I started at a time where I just wanted to do this. I saw a problem. I wanted to solve it in my own way. And I re really didn't need the money in the beginning. So it was easier, you know, at the early days, because the early days are really the hard days, right? It was earlier in the days where I wasn't making money. It didn't really bother me. I was like, okay, it's fine. I would continue. But if you really get into business with the mindset of I want to make money, that's where the real struggle begins. So your mindset is important from the onset. Also discovering what your true passion that can actually translate to money is also very important. Uh, so how do you think, um, how would you advise someone to, someone, I don't know, uh, um, some, an hustler or someone that is in the middle of, that is not in a very good state, or someone that is looking for money and is really passionate, how would you advise someone like that to sustain his uh, passion, even in the midst of looking out for money? Because people can really get lost in looking for money. 100%, like it's easy to get distracted, right? 
Yeah, because you don't get enough. You always want to get more. And before you wake up, you'll be like, when I was young, I used to play football and you could not chase it. So how do we tend to sustain our passion, even in the midst of this pressure for making money? Okay, so to be very honest with you, what I would say is, you know, the way to not get distracted and to just hold on to that passion and turn it into something big in the future is to look at the end goal, right? Always have it at the back of your mind. Okay, what am I trying to achieve with what I am currently doing? If it makes sense for you, like if you're truly, truly like, if you truly believe in what your end goal is, I think you stick with, you know, whatever challenges. Another thing that I currently really, really advise is you see how people right now, they glamorize entrepreneurship or oh, start a business. Da, 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 da. I think if you can get a nine to five, you know, like a job that pays you a salary, do it. What that would do for you is, you know, you have income coming in one way or the other. And you can focus on your other, you know, your passion until it becomes sustainable for you to do that full time. That way, you know, you're not just getting mad all the time. Okay, I have no income coming in and my passion isn't even doing enough for me. Do you you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So delayed gratification is something that we all need to learn as young people. You know, um, you make a bit of money and you think, Oh, that's it. I've arrived. I think it's so important to delay things to also understand that, you know, there's beauty in the journey. It's not easy. It's very hard. But, you know, at the end of the day, when you get there, you look back and say, you know, I actually went through this and I survived. And here I am. I think you're actually speaking directly to me. (laughs) (laughs) No, to to myself as well, right? Because I can't tell you that's okay. I've grown so much in the business, but the reality is there are different challenges at different stages of your life. The challenge I'm facing right now is, you know, maybe if I faced it, if somebody had told me two years ago I'd be facing it, I'd be like, nah, it can't be that bad. But, you know, it's different. It's harder. But I've, I'm have i more resilient now, right, because I've gone through stuff. Mm. So I think this advice is not just for it's for me. It's for a lot of people. Thank you so much. You you said earlier that you were reading book. You made, you made mention of that part where you're talking about some of the things you did was reading book. And I was like, I, when did your when did self awareness began for you or begin for you? When did you uh, when did you start that search of discovering who you are, the strength you have, the abilities you have? What prompted you to start reading? To started reading books because for me, I think it was very late after my secondary school, my dead level. I wasn't. I was. I was even reading book because I was. I was intimidated by uh, people around me. I thought everybody was reading book. When I read under mm-hmm. them, people would carry one big book and they'd be walking through this. So I'd be like, ah, books. Let me. To, let me just try it. But I was that really transformed my life. So I really want to know where self awareness began for you when you started um, looking out to discover yourself and the new strength you have in you. Can I be very honest? This podcast is, I think, one of the few interviews that I've done where people are asking, like, where you are asking, like, very important questions. Usually people would ask me, like, generic questions. And I think what you're saying, and it might be coming from a place of passion, right? And it's lovely. Um, But anyways, that's that's a side note. Thank you so much. I, I think I have been self-aware from a very young age. Now, how that became, I don't know. Um, I think it's definitely from the freedom I got from my parents, right? So my parents are not very strict parents, you know, if anything, they're in between liberal and maybe a bit of strict, right? If even that is just my mom, right? My parents always just let you discover things on your own and, you know, maybe advice you here and there. So I grew up like that. So it was very important at some point to start making decisions on your own. So self-awareness was was a no-brainer um i would say that when i started reading stuff so i was very like clear in the beginning when i told you i'm not a book reader but like i like to read articles i like to you know i just like reading stuff online or even just like on newspapers just the one pages because I don't know, like, I'd love to be that person that read, like, reads, like, a whole book, but no, I'm I'm really not that person. But I think reading is important, no matter, you know, how much knowledge you, like, how much pages you read, it's so important to read. Um, 
I think I started this around maybe 2009. I was around 12 years old when I actually started doing this because I remember it was around that time um, Facebook um, came into existence for me. I don't know when Facebook started, but that was when I had my first um, Facebook page. And I remember opening a Facebook page called Creating Your Own Destiny, which is named after a book called Creating Your Own Destiny, right? My dad loves to buy books. So we had a library at home. And so I'd always like just take a book, try to read a page or two. I'll get interested and I'll be like, okay. So I think I must have picked the Creating Your Own Destiny book. And then I got really interested in whatever the guy was saying. Now I don't even remember, but I'm pretty sure it's just you doing things to achieve, you know, your goals and carving out your own destiny for yourself. And I opened the page and I think I'll just write snippets of the books. And people probably thought, oh, this girl knows what she's doing. And I remember. <laughs> I was 12 years old sitting behind the computer in my house and people wanted to even attend a seminar I said I was going to attend. You know, think I was going to set up, thinking about it now, I would have grown so big in motivational speaking and stuff if I had continued because I remember that people wanted to attend, right? Um, but yeah, self-awareness for me must have started around that age because... I, you know, I would do stuff like that. Also, we had a day in school called Quotes Day, the secondary school that I attended in Lagos. Quotes Day was basically you bring in a quote from like a very famous person and you guys would say it in, on the assembly ground, like each person, and you're supposed to explain what that meant. And I remember that, you know, I was always excited when it was time to do that. And so, you know, it was just a series of things that led to self-awareness for me. I would say it started really around that Facebook time. Um, so a lot of us don't have that privilege where our environment could push us to discovering ourselves. We just had to probably in a way encounter it. Was probably you're lucky to have such a quality environment that could push you to discovering your self-awareness early in life. Um, yeah. yeah I, I the next question I want to ask is about your brand. Uh, uh, you built a global brand. Uh, will you say it's a lock, or do, will you say you had it, or will you say there is that particular recipe that you can give someone, uh, and that person will be able to replicate a um, a global brand? Is there a recipe okay. for it, or it's a lock for you? I'm going to be tell. I'm going to tell you that absolute truth that see even if there's luck i am not aware of it right so maybe there's an iota of luck somewhere with timing and stuff i don't know but it is very intentional like wanting to build a global brand is something that was like i knew from the beginning when i be decided timabi was going to be a business i knew from the onset that i wasn't just going to do it for you know my local people or whatever, like I knew it was going to be for the world. And, you know, how I know this is because when I go back and look at my chats with the company that made my logo, they, you know, they usually ask you, they're like, this logo is for what? Like, what's your company about? You know, what do you want to do? And I was very specific. I said, I wanted a logo for a luxurious um global handbag brand this is somebody that had zero dollars in, in the account oh, wow. <laughs> like like if you go online it's still there on their website right and when i went to get a logo done i looked at com a company that had worked for big brands like coca-cola like that's where I went. I was not able, I was like, yeah, this is where I'm going and I'm going to have them make my logo. And when they asked me, I confidently told them, I'm like, yeah, it's for a luxurious brand. And it's funny because I might have just said it with no intention to build that, but it was somewhere at the back of my mind that that's what I wanted to do. Now, when I did start the business, you know, everything I did, I made sure that you know, it was something getting me closer to the whole idea of making it global. So even though I was at some point, I was making bags in Nigeria. I didn't care that I was making bags in Nigeria. So, you know, I would I wouldn't market it, you know, 
in a way that global brands would market it. I would make sure that I'm taking pictures the way I was seeing Louis Vuitton take pictures. I was taking pictures the way I was seeing all the top brands do it. I mean, in my own little way, because obviously I don't have the budget of Louis Vuitton, right? But like I was doing it to a certain standard, standard, you know, that would play on a global stage. That's what I was doing. So it was always there. So if I was to give like a recipe, I would say, look at the brands that you admire in the world. Look at what they're doing differently from what you are doing and see if it's something you can replicate or even make better. And by, by, by replicating, I don't mean go and copy them, right? But like, just get the idea of how their business model works. What is it that they're doing that's making people pay thousands of dollars to buy a bag versus what you're doing? You know, you'd realize that it's in it's it's in the little things. Sometimes it boils down to just how you're communicating what your brand is to customers, right? It might just be in your value proposition. It's all of that. It's just very little things sometimes that sets you apart. Um, so I'd say that's number two. I'd say, you know, I think one thing that me and you have in common is stories. We realize that stories are very powerful. I, I say that a great way to build a brand is to tell a story with the brand. Um, you know, now more than ever, people want to buy into what you do, but not just that, but why you do it. So in as much as you have a great product, they want to know why that product is great, right? What's the story behind it? If you started a share butter company, People want to know where do you get your share butter from? Who are the people that work for you? What's the story behind the lady that makes the share butter? You know, she a mother of five. People buy into stories like that. So your brand story is so important and is so powerful. Um, brand communication, right? You know, your visuals are so important in, in a day of social media. People want, you know, great pictures, People want not just great pictures, but pictures that actually communicate the value of what you're selling. Because I'll give you an example. I sell bags, right? There's a particular way we take pictures that tells you that the amount I'm charging you for it is worth it. I take pictures of the details, right? You know, maybe the stitching, how it's been done properly, you know, the crystals. By the time I ask you for a certain amount, you're not coming to ask me why I'm charging this amount, right? Versus, you know, maybe some girl somewhere in Ibadan. No offense to people in Ibadan, like, who is taking pictures of maybe the same bag, right? But just taking it in a, in a, in an angle that is not very flattering and saying, okay, I'm charging a thousand dollars. I would ask you, why do you think this bag is worth a thousand dollars? Right? Like, and your answer cannot be because oh, Fatima is charging the same thing. But Fatima has communicated why it is even before I ask. I am not even going to ask. Do you understand? So things like that. Wow. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I don't want to take much of your time. I don't want to take this for granted. Thank you so much. I will ask just one last question. Um, sure. The question of, um, it's not a question. I uh, want you to, you have said a lot of great things um, in probably in two minutes, if you can help us in two minutes or three minutes. Um, just, Say that again, sorry. I said in two minutes or in three minutes, can you just speak to young Nigerians um, trying to become something? Just speak to them. Hi, young Nigerians. <laughs> I'm also a young Nigerian, but yeah, trying to become something, I would say it's very important to realize or to discover what it is you want to do for the world. People are different. You don't have to do everything that everybody else is doing. I think our be the beauty of everything lies in our uniqueness and in our authenticity. Do not change who you are for what the world thinks that you are, right? Um, if you're going to do things as a Nigerian, do it perfectly. Don't just see it from, I am a Nigerian, this is how we do things, and it has to be done this way. Think about what, how the world is doing it. Um, we already spoke about whether or not to look, you know, the people that you look up to in the world, look at what they're doing. See if it's something that you can adapt. Um, you know, go out there. 
do not limit yourself by your environment most importantly that's the most important part like do not limit yourself from where you come from because now more than ever there has never been a time where it's easy for you to get discovered by the world and to showcase your talents with the world that now you have social media at your fingertips actually make the best use of it um, put your work out there with the hope that the world will see it and even if they don't they will eventually because people are watching um you know every day people get discovered for different talents so no talent is too small um just keep doing what you're doing be patient it will happen put in the work every single day be consistent do not give up that's all i have to say <laughs> thank you so much ma'am grateful ma hi my name is fatima babakura i am the founder and creative director for tima b inc also the owner of Yerwa Secrets. I have just been listed on Forbes 30 under 30 for 2022. I am also on In Talk with Timod Mowali. Stay tuned.